The temple courts were packed with more people than usual for a typical Tuesday afternoon. Locals, priests, officials, and pilgrims were all gathered together in Jerusalem. This was no ordinary week. This was the week of the Passover, the most important holiday in the Jewish calendar. This was also no ordinary week for Jesus. This particular week was Holy Week, the week in which Jesus would suffer, die, and rise from the dead. Much to the chagrin of the Pharisees and the chief priest, Jesus was present amidst this large mass of people. He was telling them more parables. As usual, the Pharisees and chief priests listened closely, hoping to hear something with which they can use against Jesus. This time, however, Jesus' parable struck a particularly sensitive nerve in all of them. They knew that Jesus was talking about them. They knew that they were the wicked tenants. They knew that they were the ones who killed the master's son. In anger, they stormed out of the temple courts, determined to silence Jesus for good. Little did they know that they would be fulfilling everything Jesus had just said in a matter of only three days. Let's draw our attention to those tenants in that parable. Who does such a thing? Their blatant defiance of the master and his messengers is baffling. But what about the master? This is no ordinary master. He defies our expectations. Who does such a thing? What were the tenants thinking? It's safe to say that they really didn't think everything through before they acted. They knew what their master was expecting. They had agreed to the terms that were set before them. Their master wasn't asking for anything besides a share of the crops from his own vineyard. But what did the tenants do? They not only refused to give their master his share of the crops, but they beat and killed their master's servants. And then if that wasn't evil enough, then they beat and killed their master's son, too. And what was their rationale? They thought that in doing so, they would get the son's inheritance. They thought that they would get the vineyard all for themselves. And what's even more absurd is they thought that the master would just let them get away with it. Unsurprisingly, they were wrong. And those listening to the parable rightly concluded that the master would kill those wicked tenants for their egregious defiance. Unfortunately, God's people, Israel, together with their leaders, were guilty of defying God and his messengers. They had a long history of doing so despite all the blessings that God had showered upon them. Throughout the Old Testament, God sent prophet after prophet to Israel, hoping to guide them in the right direction. But often this was to no avail. Think of the prophet Elijah. Israel and her leaders defied Elijah so vehemently that he actually thought he was the only believer left in the world. Or think of Jeremiah. Perhaps no prophet was treated more shamefully by his own people than Jeremiah was. Israel's leaders sought to silence him in favor of listening to the lies of the false prophets. Israel even executed some of God's messengers, such as Zechariah, who was stoned to death in the temple courts by orders of the king himself. Much like their predecessors, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day were guilty of this same defiance. But this time, this defiance was directed towards God's most faithful and beloved messenger, his son. Jesus lamented over this in Matthew 23, verse 37, when he stated, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and who stone those sent to you, how long? 
How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her, ch her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. This defiance of God would not go unpunished. The Jewish leaders, in their anger and their hatred and their unbelief, rejected Jesus and killed him. And this defiance would not go unpunished. The wretched end that they received was eternal damnation in hell. This parable isn't too hard to understand in the context of Matthew's gospel. Matthew himself even records that the Pharisees and chief priests even understood who Jesus was referring to. They knew it was referring to them. They rejected Jesus, just like they rejected the prophets, and in doing so, they were really rejecting God. Who does such a thing? Perhaps it's easy to ask that question when we think of the Jewish leaders. But couldn't that same question be asked of us as well? Have we ever defied God's messengers? Sure, we've never beaten pastors to death or stoned them in the sanctuary. But defiance isn't limited to just physical violence or open rejection. For it's the attitudes that come out of one's heart that condemn him. Jesus pointed this out in Matthew chapter 15. He told his disciples that it's what comes out of a man's heart that makes him unclean. What is our attitude towards God's messengers? Is it annoyance? Perhaps we're annoyed when Pastor Helwig sends out an offering report which tells us that maybe we didn't give as much as we possibly could have. Is it resentment? Perhaps we resent Pastor Helwig or resent Pastor Jeske when they rebuke us personally for something we didn't think was really that bad? Is it indignation? Perhaps right now you find it irritating that a 24-year-old vicar who hasn't even been here for two months has the audacity to say in a public worship service that defying pastors is really defying God who sent them. It would be a lie for me to say that I wasn't afraid that some might think that of me after the sermon was over. But nevertheless, the point is clear. Ultimately, when we have such thoughts against God's messengers, it's not really them who we're defying, but it's really God himself who we're defying. And as God stripped the kingdom of heaven away from the Jews and their leaders because of their defiance, so also God can strip the kingdom away from us as well due to ours. As Paul tells us in Romans 11, verse 21, For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Often we are as defiant as these tenants are. And the wretched end that they received should be our wretched end as well. Eternal separation from God. Those listening to the parable rightly concluded, rightly expected that the master would punish those wicked tenants. And so also we too should expect a just and holy and righteous God to punish us for our defiance as well. But God defies our expectations. Imagine this was the first time you were listening to Jesus' parable. What would you have expected the master to do? What would you have expected them to do after the first time they rejected his servants? Any normal master would have punished those tenants right away. But this master defies our expectations. He sends them more servants. And then he sends them his own son. The tenants reacted in the same violent manner each time. 
the master's patience remain resolute. Who would do such a thing for such wicked tenants? God defies our expectations in how he dealt with Israel. God was extraordinarily patient with Israel. He was patient with them when they constantly grumbled and complained in the wilderness. He was patient with them in the time of the judges when they constantly flip-flopped between worshiping him and worshiping false gods. He was patient with them when their own leaders, the kings and the priests, were leading them astray before they were exiled. Who would do such a thing for such a rebellious nation? God defies our expectations in how he deals with us. Our defiance of God and our defiance of his messengers is not hidden before him. It's right before his eyes. He knows the hidden resentment we have. He knows the contempt that we have in our hearts. And yet, rather than punishing us, rather than condemning us, he forgives us. Christ continues to intercede on our behalf before his Father, constantly reminding him of the forgiveness of sins which he won for us. Who would do such a thing for such a sinful people like us? As the master knew that his son would be killed by those tenants, so also God the Father knew that his son would be killed by the Jewish leaders. And the son was not unaware of this either. He knew that he would be rejected by most of the people he would speak to. He knew that he was dying for a people who by nature despised him and hated him. He knew that his obedience to his father would result in his certain death. And yet, Jesus went through with it, willingly, for our sakes. Three days after he said this parable, he was dragged outside of Jerusalem and crucified. Who does such a thing? Who would die such a terrible death willingly? Who would do all that for people who defy him? Only a Savior who loves us more than we could ever imagine. As John tells us in 1 John 4 verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This gruesome death of God's son defies expectations by bringing about our salvation. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And just when we thought that Christ couldn't defy any more expectations, he does so again by rising from the dead. Christ's resurrection defied the expectations of his enemies who thought they had silenced him for good. Christ's resurrection defied the expectations of the devil who so foolishly thought he could thwart God's plan for saving mankind. Christ's resurrection defied the expectations of death itself, which could not keep him bound in the grave. And now that same death, which has no power over Jesus, has no power over us as well. My dear family of believers, Christ has brought us into his kingdom. He has made us fellow heirs of his inheritance. And as Paul tells us in Philippians 3, that inheritance, that eternal life which is ours through faith in Christ, that is the goal to which we are all straining onward towards during our earthly journeys. And God sends us his messengers, the pastors, to assist him in guiding us on our earthly journeys. Through his pastors, God crushes our sinful nature through the scathing law 
so that we can be restored and comforted by his precious gospel. Through his, bo- through his pastors, God adopts even little infants to be his own through the waters of baptism. Through his pastors, God feeds us his very body and blood so that we can be assured that our sins truly are forgiven. What a blessing it is that God has led faithful men, such as Pastor Helwig, such as Pastor Jeske, to serve him as shepherds and to feed his lambs with his holy word. We are confident that the words of faithful ministers aren't their own, but rather are the words of the Father who sent them. And with joy, we recognize that truth and gladly listen to those whom God has led to be shepherds. Who does such a thing? Certainly no ordinary God would have done what our God has done for us. What God would send his only son to be a substitute for a defiant and rebellious people? Only God the Father would do such a thing. What God would willingly take on human flesh and suffer an agonizing death for a defiant and rebellious people? Only God the Son would do such a thing. What God would bring multitudes of those defiant and rebellious people to faith through only word and sacrament? Only God the Holy Spirit would do such a thing. Only our God, the true God, would defy expectations and do such wonderful things for people like us. Only our God, the true God, would defy expectations and make our stubborn hearts willing to listen to his messengers. Only our God, the true God, would defy expectations and give us an inheritance of eternal life with him forever.